capital of Sweden is built on 14 islands of the archipelago between the Baltic Sea and Mellar Lake. In Swedish, stock means stake, home means island, so the parallel is understandable why the city is called Venice of the North. Here too, the waters, lakes and channels determine the appearance of Stockholm, just as in Venice. However, while the Italian city belongs to the Mediterranean, the Swedish capital is located at the same latitude as Greenland, Alaska and Siberia. Due to the warm currents of the Atlantic Ocean, its weather, however, is not as deterrent as we would expect when having a look at the map. The summer is generally short, but pleasantly warm, and we can say the climate of the whole country is temperate continental. The period from May to October is the most suitable for sightseeing, but the snowy winter is also a beautiful spectacle. The first houses of Stockholm were built on one of the small islands of the Strömen Channel. Around 1250, warships and trade ships, as well as the pirates specialized in robbing them, were on the Baltic Sea searching for suitable anchoring places on the channels and the freshwater Mellar Lake. It might have been the control of the waterways that made Birger Jarl establish a harbor city here. For a long time, Stockholm was the largest and most important harbor city in Sweden, receiving the status of capital city only centuries later. The heart of the city is Gamla Stan Island, together with the old city extending behind it and the junction called Slusen, from where open sightseeing double-deckers depart. The lift up the skyscraper called Katarina Hissen and its silhouette have been part of the city's image since it was opened in 1883. The steam-driven structure has since been changed to electrical and was later renewed several times. Through steel bridges and roof terraces of houses, we reach Katarina Mountain in the Mosebacha district from where we can look back on Slusen to this junction that's considered an engineering virtuosity. In this pleasant district, we find the Söder Theater and the Katarina Church. Romantic gates and stairs make it colorful, and its cafes with terraces are lookout points as well. Examining them from a bit farther away, the 300 old houses seem to provide a backdrop for the Stadsgärten Harbor. Opposite, we find the open air museum and the amusement park. A local writer, Per Sanders Vogelström, wrote, There's no doubt that the Fjellgatan is the nicest street of the city. It's an old-fashioned narrow street with cobblestones running along the top of the hill. The street lights hang out from the walls of the houses. Afterwards, the street opens and provides a fantastic view of the city and the water. The Gamla Stan, which in Sweden means Old City, is an island which provides an array of historical memorials and attractions. The Royal Palace and the surrounding houses that were built between the 13th and 18th centuries are located here. On the streets of the Old Town, various shops line the streets, fashion and home furnishing boutiques, as well as antique and souvenir shops. The Swedish design work and glass industry are world famous, so it's worth looking around at the kitchenware. Handmade lap clothing and Swedish steel hunting knives with handles made of reindeer antlers are offered at many places. Also bags and gloves are made of the reindeer leather. The bright colored Dala horse and small rooster are already considered national symbols. Objects for children are decorated with the figure of Pippi Longstocking or Niels Holgersson. Ever popular are the decoratively packed Swedish delicacies, including seasoned fish in several variations, fish salads, and jams made of cranberries or forest fruits. In spite of the often cold weather, ice cream is always popular here. The cones to hold the various flavors of excellent quality ice cream are made locally, right in the shop window. It's worth tasting the hard, round flatbread and the ginger cookies, 
both Scandinavian specialties. On Gamlestan, nearly every house has its own story. The painter, Carl Larsen, was born in one of the houses of Prescatan. Queen Christina, and later the philosopher Descartes, lived in the von der Lendiv Palace. The Bengtansen House, a trade house from the Middle Ages, has remained in its original form. The headquarters of the old National Bank with its Baroque facade was built in the middle of the 1600s. Imposing old buildings are the Gillenhelmska, the Palmstedt, and the Oxenstierna palaces. The latter was the residence of the Royal Chancellor. The name of the Baroque-style German church of the Old City reminds us that the Hanseatic League had almost unlimited influence over the harbors of the Baltic Sea, and thus also over Stockholm. This situation changed only after Gustav Vasa's ascension to the throne, but several German traders and craftsmen still lived in the Old Town. The oldest church of the city is the Storkirkan Cathedral that used to be called St. Nicholas. Lutheran doctrines were first advocated in the 700-year-old cathedral, and this was also the place of royal ceremonies. The Parhelion, a painting immortalizing an unusual light appearance of 1535, hangs here. Stortoget is one of the nicest squares of the city. The imposing palace of the Stock Exchange stands along the square. The Swedish Academy holds its sessions on its upper floor. In the Middle Ages, the marketplace was here. There was a well in the middle, and next to it, the pillory. In 1520, Danish King Christian II had 80 Stockholm members of nobility and clergy executed here. The event is mentioned in history books as the Stockholm bloodbath. Later, much more peaceful centuries followed, and the buildings which still determine the square were built. Today, Tourists have coffee on the charming verandas of the red building of the Schanzkahuset and the yellow Seifriedskahuset. The medieval arched cellars of the Grillskahuset are also popular eateries. The most important street of the old town is the Vesterlangatan. Once it ran along the city wall, but it moved further in the course of the centuries. During restoration work, forgotten facade elements and walled-up arches are still being found even today. We can see an example of this at number 29. The Mertentrotzigsgrand is the narrowest street of the city, not even 90 centimeters in width, and by climbing its 36 stairs, we can experience how big the differences in level are in this district, thought to be flat. The small street was named after a German trader who had two houses here. The Treykronor Castle was built at the end of the 1100s. For centuries, it was a fortress, then from 1520, a royal palace. It got its name from the spire decorations of the church tower. In 1697, the corpse of Carl XI was lying in state in the Trecranor when a fire broke out and destroyed almost the whole palace. In the northern wing of the royal palace, a new exhibition reminds us of the old castle. The statues of the southern facade are works of French masters. The royal family moved into the palace planned by Nicodemus Tessin in 1754. The square-shaped building surrounds a closed inner courtyard. Each of its wings represents different styles. Its eastern wings frame a terrace which is like a park. On the opposite side, a semicircular arch embraces the inner courtyard where the changing of the guard is held. The palace is no longer the residence of the ruling family, but here are the offices of Carl Gustav XVI and Queen Sylvia, and receptions for visiting heads of state and rulers are held here, as well as the swearing-in of ambassadors and other official ceremonies and evening parties. Most of the palace, consisting of 609 rooms, is a museum. Here is the treasury, the royal chapel, the throne room, the gallery of Carl XI, the bedroom of Gustav III, and his antique Roman collection. On the semicircular square, there's a changing of guard each day at noon, which is today a popular tourist attraction. Thank <laughs> you.
In 1792, a Swedish soldier dissatisfied with the war against the Russians, Captain Jakob Johan Ankerström, mortally wounded Gustav III in the Opera House. Two weeks later, the king died of his wounds in the palace. Verdi wrote his opera, A Masked Ball, based on this tragedy. Tobias Sergo's statue depicting Gustav III stands in front of the royal palace, on the side of the Nordstrom Channel. The divided shoreline, the bridges, and the winding channels give a perfect view of the sights. On every corner, a new picture unfolds before us. It's impossible to be bored with the view, which provides endless opportunities for photographers and those making videos. Sightseeing double-deckers are readily available, and short-line pleasure boats showing the sights of the city from the water offer a great atmosphere. For these, we can also buy combined tickets. This solution is good especially for those who have little time to discover Stockholm. Who pays for a hot air balloon tour can see and photograph the city from an unusual point of view. If the weather is suitable, we can always see some of the cheerfully colored balloons in the sky over Stockholm. Applications for these tours can be made at the Stockholm Information Service. We can get a free map, program booklet, and information here as well. After the Stockholm bloodbath, in 1523, a young noble named Gustav Vasa came to the throne. He was a great king and dynasty founder. 105 years later, the pride of the Swedish Navy, the battleship Vasa, was named after him. Unfortunately, as it turned out, the brilliant ship didn't even need an enemy to sink. On its first journey on August 10, 1628, in quiet sunny weather, it capsized nearly a hundred meters from the shore of Djurgarde. Only a few people survived, approximately 50 were lost. With the techniques they had at that time, the ship couldn't be brought to the surface, only some cannons could be lifted out. Later, even the exact site of the tragedy was forgotten. In 1956, underwater archaeologists led by the engineer Anders Franzen managed to find the wreck and rescued several objects of value. In the next year, 24,000 objects were brought up, one by one. In 1961, the whole ship was lifted. The 62-meter long, 12-meter wide, 52-meter high ship has been refitted from the brought-up parts in the course of 17 years, while each part has been preserved. Originally, there were 64 bronze cannons on the ship, and its stern deck was decorated with 700 statues. For the ship, an air-conditioned, tailor-made museum was built 
with suitable humidity, which has been the most popular site of Sweden since 1990. Gustav Adolf II, who ordered the building of the ship, was called the Lion of the North. Therefore, the prow statue of the ship features a lion that's about to jump. The lavish, richly curved stern and the gun barrel slits are also decorated with lion carvings. The ship can be admired from quite close, but to step on its deck is prohibited. Because of this, a life-sized copy of the gun deck has been built. On this, and on a large-scale model, it's exactly illustrated where what can be found on the deck of the ship. In addition, in the museum, there are waxworks, a multimedia show, an exhibition of contemporary objects, dioramas, and screening, which describe the period when Vasa was built. The museum is on the Leon's Latin, barely one nautical isle from the point where the ship sank. Formerly, lions were kept here for animal fights, and this is where the name of the area originates from. Nowadays, we find several cultural and entertainment institutions here. Skansen is in the Dürgarden district. This was the first open-air ethnographic museum of the world, opening in 1891. Since then, similar outdoor museums have adopted the same name all over the world. Originally, about 150, mainly wooden houses, were collected and set up here. Throughout the years, the territory of the park grew tenfold. Today, it totals more than 30 hectares. From the main entrance, we can reach the top of the hill on foot by cog railway or small train. The oldest house of Wisconsin is a shed from the 14th century. Its newest buildings are 19th century wooden houses from Stockholm. We find here manor houses and churches, peasant huts, farmhouses and workshops, mills, and even whole quarters. What mostly captivates the visitors is that here, everything is so alive. Craftsmen are at work in the workshops. There's a print shop in which the program booklet of the Wisconsin is produced by a technique that is centuries old. The glass blowing workshop attracts plenty of buyers but also those who would like to just look around. On the farm, butter is churned and cheese is made, which we can taste and also buy. The post office is in operation. We can send cards stamped with a special postmark. The grocery and the cafe are open for visitors. In the Shingleroof Segnora Church, weddings are held from spring to autumn. Grünelund is the Stockholm amusement park and is the oldest such construction in the country. It's located at the foot of Wisconsin, so we can even visit both in one day. In high season, there are tens of thousands of visitors here every day. The emphasis is on older children and young people. For the tots and toddlers, the Unibakken, close to the Vasa Museum, provides similar entertainment. As is the case in most agricultural areas, mills also play several roles here, too. Besides water mills, windmills were quite widespread and were used as much for grinding grain as for energy output. Some typical ones are exhibited in Wisconsin. Roofing with wooden shingles was widespread all over Eastern, Central, and Northern Europe, where even churches and belfries were also covered like this. The Breda Blick, a 30-meter high lookout, is a real specialty, which was moved here from the eastern part of the country. The peat and thatch-roofed Hornborgut hut is typical for the western part of Sweden, and was the home of poor peasants in the 19th century. Only one of its rooms was heated, and that was where the family survived the long, cold winters. We can get information on the various programs of Wisconsin on the internet or in tourist offices. Craft presentations are held in the workshops. 
Besides flea markets, folk music and folk dance programs provide entertainment for the visitors. We can even buy some of the herbs and spice plants of the small gardens. The zoo, which is primarily native Scandinavian animals, is especially popular among children. Leading the popularity list are the reindeers, the wolves, and the brown bears. On the playground, life-sized colorful dollar horses await children. Stockholm's particular character is partially due to its waterways, channels, and bays. The water vehicles here are as ordinary as cars. From big passenger boats and tour ships to rowing canoes, all kinds of water vehicles can be found here. In front of the Admiral Office House, an old school ship stands, which has been a popular hostel since 1949. On the speedily flowing Strömen, rowing competitions are held, while in the quiet Riddersfjärd, sailing is more popular. Just as old timers are fashionable here, veteran motorboats made of mahogany wood and copper are also much in demand. A life-sized copy of a Viking ship anchors in front of the Royal Palace. This is also a sightseeing boat, just like the small water buses. The channels are also the location for festive processions, water carnivals, and sports competitions. The waters here are especially clean. Therefore, the numbers of fishermen and swimmers are immense, especially in summer. Professional and amateur fishermen alike watch for perch here, but there's no need to go far for salmon or herring either. The original building of the parliament, or as it's called here, the Riksdagshuset, was built according to Nicodemus Tessin's plans, who also designed the royal palace. Riddarsholm is the western end of the old town. Here is the Vrangelska Palace, which was the temporary residence of the royal family during the period between the fire that destroyed the Tre Corner and the building of the new palace. Presently, the Court of Appeals is located in the building. The nearby Riddarsholm church, with its typical exterior, is the burial church of the Swedish monarchs. With two exceptions, all Swedish rulers of the last three centuries have received their final resting place here. There's no more room for tombs in the crypt, so more decorative crypts have also been placed next to the building. The strange wrought iron helmet was placed up on the tower after a fire in the 19th century. Open sightseeing horse carriages transport passengers between the Royal Palace and the Ritter's home Skirkan. The characteristic more than 100 meter high tower of the city hall with three crowns can be seen easily, both from the Gamlestan and the Ritter home church. The Staatshuset simultaneously reflects the effect of Scandinavian Gothic art and classic Tuscan architecture. Its planner was Ragnar Ustberg, the most significant architect of the Swedish Romantic style. The Nobel Prize ceremony is held in the Blue Room of the City Hall, while the banquet following it is in the downtown Konzerthuset. The chemist Alfred Nobel gained both reputation and wealth from the invention of dynamite. He was a lonely, pensive man who was enthusiastic only for science. In his last will and testament, he founded a prize consisting of a monetary reward and a medallion. The prizes are handed over on December 10th each year on the anniversary of Nobel's death. Besides the prizes for physics, chemistry, physiology or medicine, literature and peace, a prize for economics was added to the list in 1969. The Neoclassic Concerthuset, or Concert Hall, is the home of the Swedish Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. 
The Stature Group by Carl Millis Orfeos decorates its facade. The Hütorget, the square in front of the concert hall, still preserves the traditions of old times. Once fodder plants, milk, meat and fruits were sold here, and today it is still a fruit and vegetable market. The number of Stockholm's inhabitants has increased six times since the 1920s. This made necessary the demolition of old worthless buildings and the construction of the new city center as we see today. To the east of Stockholm, we can make an excursion to an archipelago consisting of 24,000 islands and rocks, while to the west, we find the less romantic islands and sand beds of the Mellar. The area was already inhabited in the Viking Ages, a fact to which several evidences point. Most of the tour ships depart in front of the National Museum, and on the way there, go along the channel between Södermalm and Your Garden, returning on the parallel channel the Djurgerds Brunviken. This way, we have a possibility to see numerous sights from the water. In the labyrinth of the waterways, we soon don't know if we're sailing on the freshwater Millar Lake or on one of the salt bays of the Baltic Sea, or maybe even on an artificial channel. We can reach some of the nearest islands in 15 minutes, but there are ones where the trip takes six hours. On the island of Birku, we can visit the traces of the first Swedish city, Birka. Birka is part of the UNESCO World Heritage. The majority of foreigners visit the island for cultural reasons, while the locals go there to picnic, swim, or do some sports. Since the 1980s, Fjederholmarna Island has been the favorite excursion place of Stockholmers. The Holiday Island is only 6 kilometers to the east of Slusen, and we can get there in 20 to 25 minutes by ship. A famous inn has been operating here for centuries, and many a tourist has visited the island, which the military expropriated after World War II. The Swedish are genuine nature freaks and try to make the most of the short summers. They go on excursions, go biking or boating, and are known to jump enthusiastically into water of about 20 degrees Celsius. Fjederholm Marna provides ample opportunity for all of the above. In the artisans' workshops, we can watch glass blowers for a long time. The country's long been famous for its glass industry. The oldest foundry was established in 1742. The Costa Boda Glass Workshop is still the supplier of the Royal Court and the Orifors Factory supplies the champagne glasses used at the Nobel Prize Ceremony. In addition to ordinary glassware, small studios also produce glass objects that will make the hearts of Scandinavian design fans beat faster. There are artisan events where tourists can also try glass blowing. It's more difficult than it seems. For guests' sake, the traditional hook of herring is still prepared. This is a potato and fish souffle made with onions and cream, which is cooked in the hot oven of the glassworks. There's also an aquarium on Fjederholmarna which presents the fauna of the Baltic Sea and shows where the various fish live in the archipelago. Restaurants here offer a wide range of fish dishes. One of the two museums of the island deals with fishing. The other one concentrates on shipping. 
We can see typical Scandinavian ships here, which some years ago were still being used by the local fishermen. Smaller boats are exhibited in the nicely restored ship manufacturing factory. The unusually clean, fresh air, the thick, dark green pine woods, the lakes shining among the endless forests, the bright blue sky, the wide rivers, the red-colored houses with their white doors and window frames forming a contrast to the green of the grass. This is Scandinavia. Huge free fields where masses of flowers are blooming in May and the trees show off in unreal colors in September. The Swedish like to sail, play golf, and go horse riding. Long ago, the horses were first of all kept for transport, nowadays for pleasure. On some farms, tourists can also ride. Even horse riding lessons are available. Sigtuna, located 40 kilometers to the northwest of Stockholm, used to be the capital. Today, this seems unlikely for such a small, friendly settlement. The oldest road of Sweden was found under the town established in the 11th century. The main street of the present town also follows in its tracks. The reason for Sigtuna's decline was that the church power relocated its religious headquarters to Uppsala, its secular one, to Stockholm. In the idyllic green parks, wild geese stroll around. In the riverside reeds, swans take care of their young. The former churches spread the good word up until the Reformation. Today, their ruins are popular tourist attractions for day trippers to Skokloster Castle. The memorials of the short heroic era of Sigtuna are the ruins of the St. Pear, the St. Olaf, and the St. Lars fortress churches. These were consecrated before the Norman era and served not only in God's honor, but also helped to protect the town inhabitants. They were not rebuilt after the Viking destruction, but their ruins clearly show the contemporary architecture has very much been determined by the element of protection. The windows are just narrow slits, the doors only wide enough for one person at a time, and high granite stone fences surrounded the building. Skokloster Castle was built on one of the peninsulas of Lake Milarn on the former site of an old monastery. The estate was given to Hermann Rangel by the king as a wedding present. His son, the later chancellor, started the building in 1654. The castle has a square ground plan, four corner towers, and multi-storied wings around an inner courtyard. Its foreyard faces the lake. Archives, a library, and a weapon collection are housed in the building. In the crypt of the red brick church, Hermann Wrangel, who married into the royal family, and his wife Margareta Grip have found their final rest. After their son's death, the castle was owned by the Bra and later the Fonessen family. Magnus Bra and his family are also buried here. Besides them, the sarcophaguses of two rulers, John III and Eric XIV, are in the crypt. 
The building of the Romanesque-style Bishop Church was started in the 12th century. A century later, it was rebuilt to a three-nave basilica. Later, it widened with transcript, sanctuary, and chapel, but it got its tower only in the 18th century. Its interior is medieval. Its main altar was donated by Stan Stewart to the bishop. In a country where there's so much water, it's natural for everyone to be fond of water sports. Sailing, water skiing, jet skiing, surfing, and kiting. And even diving, for which the cold but clear waters are especially suitable. Many like to try the warmer waters as well. For example, all the diver centers in southern Thailand are owned by Swedes. Uppsala is the educational and religious center of the country. Gustav Vasa had his castle built by Pavel Schutz, who also designed the Gripsholm Castle. The round towers closing its two ends lend the long extending building its characteristic form. Stan Stora was killed in the castle in 1567 and one century later Queen Christina abdicated the throne here. Her role was played by Greta Garbo in the famous film of the same name. On the former military inaugural square Gustav Vasa's bronze bust and contemporary cannons may be seen. From the square in front of the castle, we can see the botanical garden. In front of its neoclassic main building stands the statue of Carl von Linné, the great botanist. The university founded in 1477 is the oldest in Scandinavia. It can thank its existence to Jakob Ulfsson, but all Swedish rulers have always done a lot for this institute of higher education. The huge new main building of the university originates from the 19th century. Its main facade is neo-Renaissance, but its builders also like to use other historical style elements. Numerous buildings of the city are in close connection to the university, such as, of course, the colleges, but some research institutes and several museums are also located here. More than four million volumes are in the university library, and its manuscript collection is also considerable. The oldest Swedish printed publication and the oldest manuscript of the Edda songs and the Codex Argenteus are preserved here. The bicycles parked on the bank of the Friesen are the students' means of transport. They're cheap, don't pollute the environment, and serve the purpose in the city where there are no big distances. In many aspects, Sweden sets a good example for other European countries. One such aspect is, for instance, the high level of education. By the 1930s and 40s, the welfare state had been developed. At this time, the right to purchase housing, paid leave, unemployment aid, and the childcare benefits were all introduced. Due to its political neutrality, the country was able to preserve its achievements also after World War II. In 1995, Sweden joined the European Union, but it had become a great industrial power much earlier by its own efforts. The traditionally agricultural country's iron and steel industry led to the construction of heavy machines, cars, and planes. Saab started producing airplane motors. Today, it's conquering the car market, too. Besides cars, Volvo produces trucks, buses, and machines. Gripen is famous for its fighter planes. Swedish bearings and machine parts are well known. Minimalist Scandinavian design work became a lifestyle. IKEA is perhaps the most widely known furniture store of the world. The production of exportable industrial products is the basis of welfare. The high standard of living is, of course, coupled with high prices. 
However, on one hand, we get perfect quality goods and service for our money, and on the other hand, we can also find cheaper possibilities here, whether we're talking about accommodation, food, or shopping. For a long time, the 14th century cathedral was a royal coronation church. The length of the Gothic basilica is the same as the height of its tower, 118 meters. The largest church of Sweden was built according to classical sample, three nave with transept, choir, chapels, and two towers. In its northern tower, there's an exhibition showing chasubles, devotional objects, chalices, and church cloths. The altars, statues, and frescoes are all made by local masters. The Night of Walpurgis is celebrated all over the country, but the most spectacularly in the university cities. At three o'clock sharp, the bells start to ring, and at this signal, all graduates put on their white caps simultaneously. In the evening, bonfires are lit on the square, and with a torch procession, they celebrate the longer days and the approaching spring. The tombstones of the greats of Swedish history are in the church. Gustav Vasa, Katarina Gallo, and John II are all buried here. In addition to nobility, Chancellor Bengt Austin Stierna, the botanist Linné, and some bishops are also resting here. Under the leadership of Gustav Vasa, the church's enormous amassed property was transferred to the state. This composed, and still composes perhaps even today, the basis of Sweden's economic power. With clever management, the young ruler made his country prosper, and at the same time, separated from Catholicism and founded the Lutheran State Church. Under his descendants' rulings, the country became one of the great powers of Europe. Eric XIV led wars with Denmark and Poland. In addition to this, Gustav Adolf II had conflicts with Russia, and at the encouragement of his chancellor, Axel Ostenstierna, he entered the Thirty Years' War as well. During this time, the king died in the Lützen battle, so his daughter, Christina, came to the throne only six years old. Her resistance against marriage degenerated to the point that to the benefit of her nephew, she abdicated her throne and left for Rome. She's buried in the St. Peter Basilica. With her leaving, the Caroline era began. Sweden lived its golden ages under the reign of the three rulers named Karl. They overcame Denmark, and the conquered areas were divided among the king, the noblemen, and the peasants. With the 1700s, Sweden's great and powerful era ended. Though Karl XII had defeated Poland and Denmark, the third ally, Russia, seemed to be a bigger challenge. The king was killed in 1718. The new constitution transferred the power from the ruler to the parliament, and in doing so, a parliamentary democracy similar to the one in Britain was formed. During the Napoleonic Wars, the difficulties of selecting the right ruler led to the point that one of Napoleon's marshals, Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, became the ruler. He took the name Karl Johan and studied Swedish, though not perfectly. He established a dynasty, and until today, his descendants sit on Sweden's throne. The beginning and middle of the 19th century was the time of industrialization. Sweden started to evolve from an agricultural society to a developed industrial country. The sudden advance of the Social Democrat Party gave a serious push to the campaign for a general right to vote. Minister Per Albin Hansen and his government activities helped in strengthening the welfare state. The most well-known political representative after World War II was Prime Minister Olaf Palma, who was murdered in 1986. The death of the highly respected Prime Minister evoked astonishment and deep shock all over the world. However, the solving of the murder has remained unsuccessful. After joining the European Union, Sweden has had to face new opportunities and challenges.
the archipelago around the capital has quite a unique image. People here live in the direct vicinity of the often bleak nature. However, many commute to the bigger cities by scheduled boats, and many work locally. The operations of the lighthouse, water transportation, or fishing are still as important activities today as centuries ago. Many people work in disaster prevention and for the Coast Guard. Ninasham and some other islands have also become involved in tourism. The Swedish countryside, the sleepy small towns, and distant islands have supplied subjects for the two most well-known writers of the country. All of Astrid Lindgren's novels for the youth take place here. Ronja, the robber's daughter, originates from medieval tales, while she puts her Bill Bergson series into an imagined, however very real, Swedish small town, Lil Köping. The Nobel Prize winner, Selma Lagerlöf, in her work entitled Niels Holgersson's Marvelous Journey, gives an overview of the country's geography, fauna, and flora. Her novel, Gusta Berling, describes a cheerful world full of holidays, colorful romantic adventures, northern sagas, legends and tales spread by the oral tradition, which all feed from a farmland reality, where she spent her childhood and teenage years. In 1914, she became the first woman member of the Swedish Academy. When talking about Swedish literature, we have to mention August Strindberg, who started medical studies at the Uppsala University. He worked as a home teacher, telegraphist, theatrical pupil, librarian, and journalist. Finally, his plays and dramas made him a great character of Scandinavian literature. Nowadays, his place has been taken by Ingmar Bergman, who is mainly known as a film director, but besides his screenplays, his novels and dramas are also significant. Astrid Lindgren wrote the following in one of her novels. The main street rested in the deepest peace and was dreaming in the summer sunshine. The chestnut trees were flowering. Main street and small street. That's it, plus the main square. The rest is just cobblestone, bumpy alleys, and street parts that lead down to the river or suddenly end at some dilapidated house which only stands there on the grounds of age and opposes all modern city planning. Most of the gardens are rather topsy-turvy, overgrown by old knotty apple and pear trees. The worn-out grass is never cut. Most of the houses are big wooden makeshifts, the beauty of which caused the architect of the last era to become wildly drunk, trimming them with the most unexpected jutting ridges and towers. Actually, it's not a nice city, but some antiquated homely peace spreads from it. Nevertheless, some beauty is in it, at least on such a hot summer day, when the roses and gillyflowers and the peonies are blooming in every garden and the foliage of the linden trees on Small Street are quietly reflected in the street, which is babbling so slowly and pensively in its furrow bed. Perhaps we wouldn't even be surprised to see Nils Holgersson on the back of a wild goose flying above similar white-framed red houses. Maria Fred is an idyllic small town visited by thousands of tourists. 
We can also reach it on an excursion boat, but the real interest of the area is the small train, which operates only in the summer. The small, narrow-gauge train runs between Maria Fred and La Gesta, along banks and through forests and fields. Since Kurt Tucholsky wrote his novel Gripsom Castle, tourists have been overrunning the romantic building standing on one of the small islands of Lake Malaren. The writer, as he wished, is buried in Maria Fred. The waters around the castle are full of swans. The castle standing in the picturesque area was named after the royal family Grip. The road leading to the entrance of the castle is edged by stones with runic letters on them. Later, it was the property of the Danish Queen Margaret and that of Stenstura and Gustav Vasa as well. Charles IX made considerable changes here. From this time originate the southern and the western yards and the forecastle. Hedvig Eleanor, who received the castle as a wedding present, had it extended by adding a queen's wing, while Gustav III had a knight's wing and theater built. He set up his working room in the Grip Tower and considered Grip's home as a kind of summer residence. In the entrance hall, the portraits of the Vasa kings may be seen. From the rooms, first of all, the ceremonial hall, Gustav Vasa's bedroom, Gustav III's white drawing room, the theater, and the Westphalia gallery are worth visiting. In the inner courtyard, cannons and flower pots form an unlikely harmony. On the walls, reliefs commemorate the former owners. In the beautiful garden cottage, the hothouses and the botanic garden, genuine rarities of the plant world are grown. If after visiting the sites of the area, we still have energy, we can make ourselves familiar with Stockholm's evening and nightlife. The Swedish capital is full of cultural activities. Cinema, theater, concert, or just an elegant supper? No problem. It's a local specialty that couples dressed in dinner jacket and evening dress, hurrying to a concert or opera, travel by motorboat. There's less traffic than on the roads, but sometimes there's a short wait at the sluices. The spectacle of the sluicing ships always attracts crowds. And not only tourists are gaping at these times, but even the locals stop again and again. The level of the different water surfaces differs, and this problem, requiring great attention, must be solved. Sailing on the channels of the illuminated city is in itself an interesting activity. The silhouettes of the well-known buildings are drawn black on the sky, playing in orange and violet shades after the sunset, and the dark water multiplies the reflections of the evening lights of the city. On Saturday evenings, many take their American old-timers, not used during the week, just to show to each other and to the world how nicely they've reconstructed these vehicles, which are often 60 to 70 years old. Saturday evening is the time for social life, partying, eating and drinking. Sunday night is quieter. It's mainly devoted to family and relaxation. The Swedish like to go to restaurants. The poor peasant, rustic cuisine has become much milder and richer throughout the past decades. 
Today, it satisfies even the most refined foreigner, and those fond of fish dishes could not even travel to a better place. The inevitable parts of the famous smorgasbord, a buffet meal, are meatballs. Fish is often served salted, smoked, or in some kind of sauce. Salmon, trout, herring, and burkling are popular. Of course, sausages, pâtés, and wild mushrooms are not to be missed either. In Sweden, there's a kind of festivity each week. If there isn't a holiday, then there's some kind of festival, sport, cultural, gastronomic, or music event.